first interview that I've done like this. So if I say something wrong or something, I think is this one of the first. This is my first done? interview ever. So if I absolutely like say something like horrendous, I hopefully he cuts it, or hopefully he just like like not horrendous and blasphemy, but like just horrendous as in like that answer was terrible, or like that just did not flow in an interview that doesn't feel like an interview. So I don't know. I'm just sort of answering the questions how I feel led and. Yeah, hope, I hope I'm helping people out here. Amen, amen. I'm here with Kevin Tucker, owner of KT Barbershop and Ministry. And I'm going to be asking him some questions today pertaining to Christian business life and mm -hmm. ministry. So Kevin, um, would you like to introduce yourself and also give a testimony of how you came to Christ? Yeah, so my name is Kevin Tucker. And as he said, I own KT Barbershop and Ministry right now. And my testimony of how I came to Christ was... There's actually three times the Lord really spoke to me. One was when I was 14, and I remember I was in the church pews, and I was just sitting there, and I was really questioning if God was real. And then just His presence flooded me, and I began to weep. And I didn't understand any of it. I didn't understand the peace of what it was, or because it literally passed all understanding. And then being the 14-year-old self that I was, I looked, I looked up, and I was like, I can't let anyone see me cry. I'm 14. I'm not, I'm not like some baby. So I like sucked it up. And being 14, I just continued with my life and didn't care. And then high school came around, around junior year. And I had my first girlfriend, and she took me to, um, it was some youth group thing. And the first first few times, I really didn't do anything. It was just sort of like one year and out the other. Heard the gospel a million times since I was younger. Went to church, and my parents were the whole, you know, when you stop, when you don't want to, like, make your decision, like, you can stop going if you want it. I did. And so... She took me in there, and there was this one time I remember he was just preaching a normal message. It wasn't even about repentance or anything, and it was that same voice once again, and it just cut deeper than any two-edged sword, and I just began to weep again. And this time, I went up to him, and I hugged him afterwards, and I was just, like, floored by Christ. And after that, I knew he was real, but I didn't live for him. And I think that happens to a lot of people is they realize Christ is real. They have this moment with him, but they don't live for him. So, you know, I'd be in the lunch table, lunch room, whatever, and people would be like talking about Christ or something and how it's all fake. And I'd be like, no, God's real. Like, I know he is. And like, how do you know? And I'm like, he just is. Like, I, I know he is. And I never read my Bible or did anything or pursued him in any possible way like that. And so when apologetics came in or anything like that, or people asked me why, it was just, just because. And so I remember I went on a snowboarding trip one time about two and a half years ago, and I threw my Bible in there for some reason. I think it was probably just, you know, I do believe in Christ, might as well read a little bit. And I was reading Matthew, and it took the Lord three times. So this was the third and final one, and I was reading, and I just got floored by that again. And I was like, what what do you I remember I was like what do you want to tell me God I know you're here right now this, this barely happens what do you want to tell me and it was Kevin you can't like look at this and this and then be like I'm going to ignore this part and just keep living the way you want to live and if you're going to believe in the gospel you got to believe the true and full thing and so I remember I was flipping through it and I saw the part where it said like he who loses his life for Christ finds it and he who tries to save his life loses it and I was like man if I'm gonna believe this why am I not believing the full thing and just going all out because ultimately this life is a blink of an eye and the only reason we're here is for Christ and so I took my vape and I threw it to my sister and I was like don't let me ever hit that again I mean of course I had my struggles through that but overcame that and so that was pretty much my testimony of how I came to Christ and that was kind of in Barber College and that kind of leads into probably some other questions, but I was in Barber College kind of when I like actually started pursuing Christ. You know, Kevin, a famous preacher once said, have you no desire to see others saved? Be sure you're not saved yourself, right? Yeah. So immediately when we find Christ and you really get close to Christ, there's a desire to see others won. Mm. And so since you found Christ yourself, what has been your experience of then taking that gospel and sharing it with others? You know, it, it reminds me a lot of what Jeremiah said of it bubbles up within and he has to say it. Like he has to speak, he has to prophesy. And 
that's kind of what it's like if I keep my mouth shut too long. It's almost like I have to go out in the first, like, I'll just, like, I need to open air preacher. I need to talk to someone or something like that because it's just too much within me. But that also can be very crippling in many different ways for me because, you know, someone sits in your chair and it's not their time yet and you don't see that fruit and you know the Lord's like, wait, these, the Lord wants to see them come to Christ more than you do. Someone actually very recently just told me it takes about 40 people to bring someone to Christ. And the first person thinks they did nothing. And the last person thinks they did everything. And they're both wrong. And so each person, you know, wherever you're at within that, it's, it all matters. Whether that person rejected it completely or whether that person was floored by it and came to Christ. Ultimately, it's God who does it all. And you can't put that weight on your shoulders because it's very crippling. If you start putting the weight of, I'm doing the salvation and I'm doing it. Because you have to remember that God cares way more about their salvation than you ever can. Mm -hmm. And so just going through and speaking to people in my barber chair, at the end of every, no matter what haircut, whether we talked about Christ or not, I look at him and I say, do you need prayer for anything? I'd love to pray with you before you get out of here. And almost every time they say yes, whether they're an atheist, even other religions, they'll accept prayer. And my prayer half the time is like, God, I don't know what this person needs. They may not even know themselves what they need to see you, but you know them better than they know themselves. And I ask that you reveal yourself in a way that they cannot deny. And that is one of my favorite prayers because, you know, the Lord truly knows them and he knows what it takes for that person to believe, whether it's an inner interaction with someone, uh, things spoken over them, or it's just them revealing themselves in the Bible. Amen. 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 Since you brought it up, I want to get into it now. You know, what is your advice for like workplace evangelism? Because it's like an interesting line. On one level, mm -hmm. they're a customer who's like paying you money for services. On another level, they're a lost soul that even shortly after you meet them, they could potentially enter into, you know, eternity. Yeah. Um, and you may be even one day, you know, you might meet someone that's you're the last person they talk to potentially. So how do you reconcile the idea like they're giving you money for services with the need to share the gospel? You know, what, how yeah. have you wrestled with that and how have you? There actually was, there's a lot of wrestles with that because I would, I went down like every rabbit hole possible with evangelism in my chair. There was a point where I would only be very spirit led. If the Lord would give me a word for him, I'd tell them. If it was something else, then, then I wouldn't say anything if I didn't feel it at all. Or sometimes I'm like, well, everyone needs to hear the gospel. So no matter what happened, I tell them the gospel. Or at the end, I'd be like, can I tell you the testimony of Jesus before you get out of here? And so I went down every rabbit hole of, I didn't care what I looked like because I just wanted them to know. I just wanted to follow the Lord. I didn't care if someone was mad at me as long as it was the reasoning for Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was Christ wanting me to do that. And now I've come to realize that, you know, one, they pay me at the end. So if they're really bothered by it and they don't pay me at all, I'd rather them hear the gospel and not pay me and leave mm -hmm. and never come back. Because there is a, like counting the cost of having a Christian business. Mm -hmm. You are going to offend people. I mean, the Lord says that. But one thing I always look back to is if the Lord established this place, then he will uphold it mm -hmm. no matter what that looks like. And so I believe that there's a lot of times where, you know, you do have to, you'll, you'll be able to know. Like this it goes into another thing of being mature in Christ. When you're mature in Christ, you can understand when the Lord's saying, this person needs fire and brimstone. This person needs a father's love and a father's touch. This person needs a rebuke or mm -hmm. this person needs to be encouraged with their pursuit of Christ or wherever they're at. So as you're cutting their hair and getting to know them, it's building a relationship in a short period of time. And just other Christian businesses, as you're spirit led, you know, you'll be able to know you're gonna mess up. As long, like that's one of the things is you're going to mess up. You're not perfect, you're not Christ. And it goes back to what I said. God wants to see them saved more than you do. You're not gonna mess someone up. If your heart posture is for God, He's going to use it, even if he has to take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. Even if the person throws a punch at you or the person spits in your face, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, God is the one who's going to work on their heart. And you may not see it. This is why we walk by faith and not by sight in evangelism as well. You may not see it, but the Lord could floor them at any moment or change their mind. There's so many times where I'll be praying for a, even maybe a family member or a friend and they just, you know, all of a sudden their mind's just completely different the next time I talk to them. And I did absolutely nothing to do that other than pray. 
and the Lord did all the heavy lifting for me. There's so many times I think I have to know all the apologetics or everything, but you also forget that in our weakness, he is strong. If you have to have every answer for every evangelism opportunity, you're going to be very crippled by that mm -hmm. because you're going to run into something where you don't have the answer and saying, I don't know, is also a strength because the Lord will give you in that moment what to say. Even if you do say like, hey man, I don't know what this is. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know who God is. And half the time people come to Christ not because you tell them some amazing historical fact or why the Bible has to be absolutely true. And it's good to know those things because some people that is being spirit led, you tell them that. But a lot of the times it's by a testimony or it's by your own experience with God, your own relationship with God, or just knowing the Gospels and your walk with God because you begin to learn the characteristics of him. And if you know the characteristics of God, you can answer almost any evangelist question because you know how, like what God's heart is for that answer. You can say, I may not have a scripture for this, but I know who God is and I know what his heart is. But yes. yes. Like I hear when you're saying all this, I hear like how Jesus says, abide in me, the branch can't bear fruit. Exactly. You know, unless, unless, it, unless you abide in Christ, you can't bear fruit, you know. And neither he that planteth, neither he that watereth, but it's God that brings the increase. Yeah. There's a, a, one of the things I've been wrestling with recently was it was the Lord, because I was getting like that crippling thing of like, God, like I suck at evangelism. I need you mm. to do it for me. Like yes. I need you to be in me because my flesh is terrible. And I just keep thinking of Peter when he cries out to the Lord and all the times where he says like, Lord, you're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to do this. And he says, get behind me, Satan, I, or, I rebuke you. And or he says, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And it reminds me of, you know, he had this vision of himself, of someone who would stand up for Christ in every situation. And I have this vision of myself of someone who evangelizes in every situation, who tells every single person about God, who is perfectly spirit-led, who says the perfect things, no matter what the person's thinking, and it just hits the hammer or the nail with the hammer like perfectly on the head and just drives it straight home. And I have this vision of myself, and then I fall short of that. And am I going to go away and fall down? The Bible says the righteous stumble, but they get up time and time again. Yes. And the, the thing about Peter is, though he denied him, and though he didn't live up to this person that he thought he was in his head, Christ was still on the cross. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It never was about us or what we could do for Christ. You don't pull out of your great love for Christ, but rather... Christ's great love for you. And hey, that's man. how you evangelize. Is It's not about you or how much you love the Lord. You know, being bold isn't about how much you love the Lord, but it's about how much Christ loved you. And ultimately, that's the fear of the Lord is, you know, am I doing this for man's, like, for fear of man, or am I doing it fear of the Lord? You said you don't pull out of your great love for Christ, but Christ's great love for you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because ultimately you're going to run dry. You're going to have days where you're on fire for the Lord, days where you're timid, and days where you're just not feeling it. And if you keep running off of that, you're going to run dry real fast. Feelings come and feelings go. Feelings are deceiving. My warrant Amen. is the word of God. Nothing else is Amen. worth believing. That's good. Yes. Amen. And on the, on the business side of things, there are all these verses in the Bible, like um, the hand of the diligent maketh rich, but the slack hand tendeth to poverty. Or seest thou a man diligent in his business, he will stand before kings, he will not stand before mean men. And all these different verses where, you know, the, the Bible prescribes hard work and diligent work. Mm. I guess I want to ask you, what is a piece of advice for you ha that you have for Christian entrepreneurs looking to do something like what you do? Where they have a business and ministry connected on the business side of things or the life side of things. What is a piece of advice you have for them? pursue Christ and all things will be added unto you. Amen. I mean, like this whole Amen. place, I didn't even want a barber shop. Like after in Barber College, when I found God, I was like, do I just go to seminary now? Or like, what do you want me to do, God? And I felt led just to keep doing what I was doing. And I didn't want to steward a barber shop because I was like, God, that is way too much. Like, I don't, I feel like that's way, like you're giving me too much to steward. I don't want to take something just because I see it's like from an earthly point of view, that's cool and like nice to have. I want to do it because you gave it to me and I don't want to like grab all these things that aren't built upon you. And so he literally threw this into my lap as I was pursuing Christ. Then literally, this was just like a cement block down here at one point and we redid everything. And he started, like people just started coming in, hey, I feel led to give you this. I got 
mirrors for free. I got the flooring done for free, the lighting done for free. Everything just started coming in for free. And if there was something that was too expensive, I just waited. And the Lord popped up with something that was better and cheaper. And I was like, this is, um, this is like, because I'm pursuing Christ. I wasn't pursuing anything else. Now, that doesn't mean neglect what he's given you to steward. Steward it well, but don't put it above God. Like, don't, um, like, you'll know when the times come when there's a decision to be made. And when that decision is made, look for what Christ's characteristics are and what it is and what the fruits of the Spirit follow. Because if you start pursuing what's best for your business or what's best for this instead of what Christ is calling you to, I mean, I always tell people, God established this place, and when he calls me to stop, I'll shut it down. Because ultimately, if that's not where God is, then that's not where my peace is, and that's not what I'm called to do. And I'll have the most fulfillment in wherever the Lord is. So if I keep doing this business and he called me to stop, one, it's going to pull me farther away from the Lord. I'll probably get burnt out, and it just won't have Christ and it won't be fruitful and so I would say just steward it well pursue it with everything you have like like when you wake up and as like as you as he puts these things on your mind to do them like don't just put them aside pursue advertisement pursue making it boom pursue making it big and I mean you can like pursue Christ but also pursue like financially as well he calls us to steward our money well. Don't just start blowing it and doing stupid things with it and pursue to save it so that you can increase and put back into what the Lord has given you so that it can flourish. Because, I mean, if you keep throwing away things he gives you, then why would he continue to give you that? Yeah, I think of the verse where, like, in the house of the wise there's much treasure, no, but the foolish spendeth it up. Exactly. And, like, when you're in business, if you're a Christian businessman, There will always, 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 just like when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, there'll be an opportunity to just cut some moral corners and make a little bit of fast cash. Oh, there's there's a verse about, I cannot, the Lord basically says, like, why do you, something about building his house, and would you give him, like, materials that are poor to build a strong house? Mm. And the... It's going to bother me that I can't remember it now, but it's about the builder being greater than the creation and things like that. But if you cut cor- exactly, if you cut corners on a house, it's going to collapse. If you cut corners on your business, it's going to collapse. Don't take the fast path or anything. Take the path that is of God. Because if you start doing that and you start being like, well, I can cut corners here and make money this way, or I don't have to establish this, and I don't have to go the legal route on this, I can, I can um, do my taxes like, and all this illegally and all this stuff, like the Lord will not honor that like that is not honorable to the lord that is not having the fear of the lord because ultimately when you go against what christ says in his word that is lacking the fear of the lord and that is not where wisdom is at or anything of that nature there's a proverb that says um a house is built by uh, wisdom it is established by understanding and it is filled with knowledge and so if you build all of that up and you build your house upon just foolishness is going to be ransacked and torn down and strongholds will be put up and yeah went off on a tangent there but that was good that was good i mean proverbs says the blessing of the lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it now keep in mind we're not prosperity gospel people or anything like that but truly when god increases your finances he doesn't add all this sorrow with well i'm breaking the law here i'm cutting Mm. corners i'm doing this you know, and it's awesome that you have encouraged uh, the audience to not cut corners and stay on the narrow path. Not go for uh, Satan's fast money schemes that he's going to offer you when you go into business and in life. A man once asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Even we were at Blaze Pizza one time and we were just talking about the things of God. And someone comes across the room, you know, and you think, oh no, I've been talking too loudly. I'm about to get rebuked by like some far left liberal who hates the gospel or something. But he comes up... You know, from across the room in Blaze Pizza, and he says, You know, I've been hearing you guys talk about the gospel. You know, my dad's been witnessing to me for years. I think I want to get saved now. How do I get saved? And he just sat down, and we began to tell him how to be saved. If someone were to sit in this chair and say, Kevin, what must I do to be saved? What would you tell them? I would explain the gospel, and I would do it in the way of, have you ever heard of the three circles method? 
Dude, tell me about the three circles. So it's kind of like, so, I mean, I don't have a way to draw it out right now. I was actually going to get a whiteboard and put it up right there. So that like, as you're talking to someone and they talk about a lot of people unload their problems and you're like, they, I guess they think I'm also a certified therapist, but I mean, I'll just ask the Lord at the time. But so with that, you can say, you know, you want me to show you something that helps with my brokenness and helps me through the brokenness of the world. And I, can I show you something? And, you know, I actually just learned this from a pastor evangelist the other day. And he said, so that's how he transfers into it. But I was going to get a whiteboard and show him and turn him around. But can I show you this? And it would be three circles. And you draw the first circle and say, this, this is God's original plan for the earth. It's, you know, euphoria. It's perfect. There's nothing that is wrong with it. And then sin enters the world. An arrow comes out. And you draw sin and this. Now the wages of sin is death, and there's brokenness, decay, death, things that are wrong with the world, disease, poverty, all this stuff comes into the world, and this is what we experience. This is why we struggle. This is why things happen because of sin. And this is the world we're in now. You draw the next circle, brokenness, and people try to escape this circle with wealth, drugs, alcohol, relationships, and you know, some of that may uphold you through this life, but at the end of it, there's nothing. It doesn't lead anywhere else. It leads, leads you to destruction, death. It just makes things worse. Maybe a Band-Aid over a deadly wound or something. And so this is what so many people try and do and to make up for this sin. And then you draw the next arrow and say, this is the gospel. This is what Christ did. He died and he rose again, being the perfect sacrifice for us because... Like I said before, the wages of sin was death. And the only way you can pay for that is by a perfect death, the lamb on the cross. And he died and rose again, and now he intercedes for us with the Lord because the only way to get to the Lord is by being perfect. And so when we repent and trust in him and allow him to take our sins and allow and believe in that, now what does it mean to repent and live a life like that? When you repent, you allow Christ to come in and dwell within you. And you'll have these fruits of the Spirit. And it's not perfect yet because we're still in a broken world. So there's still all these things going on. But through it, Christ walks through the fire with you, giving you the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy, happiness, kindness, all of them, self-control. And he, he allows us to be able to maintain these things and maintain within him. And to live a Christ-like life. You know, I had desires. And I, when I was dead, I had these lustful desires that just overtook me. I was a slave to the world. But as you come to Christ, you begin to switch your desires. You, you try and maintain, you draw another arrow to the euphoria of what Christ called us to be originally. And you try and live that way now. And so trying to live that way, you, your desires change. Christ is in you and everything. And so it doesn't look like the life you once lived. You are born again. And just as Christ said, you can't put old wine in new wineskins. If you try and live a lifestyle with a new spirit, one of them will burst. And so you need a new wineskin for the new wine that Christ has for you and the new blood of Christ. And as that washes over you, cleanses you, just as you don't clean yourself up before you get in a shower. You get in the shower and it cleans you up. You can't change your ways without Christ. And you won't be a slave to those things anymore. And so as you come to Christ, he'll change your desires. As you desire to be more Christ-like, he gives you the strength to do it, to overcome it. And let me tell you, you know, so many people want to, um, they want to continue drinking as Christians. They want to continue living in adultery and, or homosexuality and all these things. And you can't, like I said before, you can't have the new wine and the old wineskins. When you overcome those things, you will have more joy than if you fell into that. In those lifestyles. If you truly are in Christ, it's a struggle to overcome those. Some people don't want to overcome those things, but if you truly continue to pursue Christ, something will have to give. It says you can't serve two masters. You will either hate one or love the other. And you can look at your life. Am I loving being on my phone more than I am in the Bible? It's a harsh fact, but the Lord also said, cut off your hand if it causes you to stumble. But am I loving you know, going out and partying with my sinful friends and going and hanging out with my Christian friends. And you can look at these things and see the fruits of your life and which world are you serving, which God are you serving. And so your desires will be transformed 
and your lifestyle will be changed. And it may not be pleasant at first, but as you overcome those, the joy of overcoming that and the joy that Christ gives you is so much more than downing multiple bottles a night, than sleeping around. That fulfillment is empty. It comes to an end immediately as soon as the next day rolls around and you need that high again. Christ is not a high. He's a lifestyle and he is a living God that restores your soul. And so, you know, within the, even when you're talking about repentance and believing, you can ask them and say, is this, where do you feel that you're at within these three circles right now? Do you feel you're in the brokenness? Do you feel that you're trying to repent? Do you feel like you don't even know the Lord? Or where do you feel that you're at? Or you could ask, what is stopping you from coming to that today? Or what would be stopping you from repenting and being able to experience this newness in Christ? And some people, you know, from there on, you can begin to answer other questions. But that's an excellent way to share the gospel. And that's what I would tell someone. I would take them through the whole thing so that they, I mean, initially, just what they mainly need is Roman. What, why can I not remember this, bro? This is like the, thou wilt the, confess with thy mouth Jesus yes, is yes. Lord and believe in thine heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That, that's the, yeah, that's like the staple. And that's, that's the main one that I would speak to them about is, is not, it's believing in your heart, not just professing it and then walking away and being like, oh yeah, I'm saved. And then, you know, going out and completely, like I said, like I was when I was 14, I completely forgot about it. The Lord showed me who he was and I just completely forgot. And I, I wasn't saved. I just thought about it. He was still chasing me down and he still loved me. I had an experience with God. Yeah, but it wasn't a salvation experience. And so yeah don't know if y'all are getting tired of my voice because i just literally i felt like that was a run-on sentence i didn't pause for a second so hopefully i feel like sometimes my voice can be monotone when i talk so long but yeah amen amen brother kevin and i think i've got one more question for you i know you have a dude coming in here soon you know someone may ask what must i do to be saved and then you have a lot of people who get saved but they're going back and forth, you know, back to the bottle. You know, one night they're serving the Lord, the next night they're serving the bottle. One night they're following God, and then the next night they're running off with an ungodly person in a relationship. Or, you know, one night they're serving God, then they find, you know, a way to get into drugs again. So how does a Christian go from vacillating back and forth, backsliding and walking with God to just totally walking with God, living an overcoming, victorious life? Is there a, a simple way... To get there well bad company corrupts good character surround yourself with the people that you want to be like i mean they say it all i mean I, you've probably heard of hey family show me your was it three friends and i'll show you your future How, what's the quote that you said yeah they, so they say show me your friends and i'll show you your future yeah that's what it is and so i mean that's a huge one if you're hanging out with that kind of stuff you're definitely going to be having that challenge and that struggle and the other thing is when you talk to someone about god don't just share your faith, but share yourself. Like we are called to be there. We are called to be servants to help them. If you truly desire that person to be saved, you'll do anything it takes. If you truly love like Christ's love, you'll give them your phone number and say like, hey, I want to meet up with you. I want to talk with you. I want to disciple you and raise them up. He said, make disciples of the world, not just go preach and then walk away. And I mean, definitely you can preach and then walk away if there's no one there listening. But the... It's definitely sharing is a big part. Sharing your life and who you are is a big part of that. So, I mean, if you are struggling with that, go to a church. God has not called us to be alone. He's not called us to walk this just without any fellowship. He wants us to be one body united. And so share it with your friends. Don't be ashamed. And if your friends are having are judging you and call it, like calling you out and saying all these like bad things, of course, like call you out in love, but... If they're doing it in a way that's not uplifting or helping you in any way, then honestly find new friends that will help walk with you because we were all there at one point. If they just shame you for being less than or say you're not far enough in your walk, like there's, they should be helping you through this and get you to a point. So just surround yourself with those people. Talk with your pastor. Talk with others and read your word. Get ground. Don't try. The biggest thing that I made a mistake when I first came to Christ was hearing all this meat teaching because he says drink milk first then go to the meat and I was hearing like all these in-depth theological things and I was trying to apply those to my life before I applied the elementary core teachings of Christ which was being a servant to people loving those around me making sure my family was okay before I went out and evangelized to a bunch of people I mean if I can't 
if I can't love my mother or take care of my family, just even as a son or help with yard work, if I think I'm above that, then there is a huge problem. And as you get grounded in those things and as you get grounded in being able to help those around you and pursue those around you, you'll build that up so that when you go out and talk to someone, it's genuine. It's not just you're, you're a voice and not an echo of what someone's saying. You're your own voice, you're your own walk, it's authentic, it's genuine, and you're not just echoing what some pastor said so that you sound like you know what you're talking about. Because when they come down to it and they start saying like, what they say like, well, what do you mean by that? Then And they start like digging into what you're talking about and they start digging into the soil and the dirt, there's no roots down there. You're just gonna come up with blank and it's not gonna be genuine because when you speak with someone and you have true compassion and true love for that person, it cuts so deep rather than you're just like, I know this sounds good and it's going to stir someone up. And I mean, there may be a time and place for that, and the Lord can use that, but definitely mature in your faith before like going out and pursuing these high teachings of Christ. And it, it, it definitely sucks to do because everyone wants to be, you know, that person like all the way up here, and they want to be seen in other aspects, but would you be okay if, you know, Christ never used you in a way like that? And I feel like the only way to get to a mindset like that is learning the elementary ways of Christ. And then none of this high stuff truly is like, like you're not putting it on a pedestal. And it, like I said before, it's added onto you when you're ready for it. If you're holding something you're not ready to hold, you're going to drop it and shatter what Christ has for you. So just, you know, being patient in what he is building. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So running with the right people and being patient and also going after the elementary principles before getting so deep into doctrine. Yes. Like when you get saved, focus on living a holy life, being good to your family and friends and not necessarily mm. focus so much on like, like reform doctrine or Calvinism yeah. or Arminianism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like read through the Bible and then it, like let him show you. Don't like, because everyone that speaks to someone, they have a lens of Christ and what they believe. And as you're speaking to that person, you're initially putting that lens of what you believe onto that person, which is why I believe teachers are judged harder because ultimately you're completely transforming the way someone sees Christ and you're telling them what you know. And if that's wrong, then you just put a lens on someone and now they're completely seeing Christ in a completely different manner of what God truly is. And that can be very dangerous and scary. So that's why I believe like before you teach someone, you should initially know what you're talking about. Amen. That's really good. That was really good. That was a good interview. Thanks. <laughs> I enjoyed I enjoyed this interview very much. Yes. I was honestly pretty like I was like nervous at first and then as soon as we started talking, I was fine. Because I was just like I was getting nervous that I was gonna blank on a question or something, just be like just like completely forget everything Christ taught me or everything in my life and I was like Man, what's my name? What's my name? No. <laughs> yeah, next interview, maybe I'll interview you on doctrine, ask you about Calvinism and if you yeah, believe yeah. in individual predestination and Yeah, well some of that stuff I'm still like it's just an answer of I don't know because I'm still like allowing Christ to refine me in that aspect of what it is. Okay, did Christ die for everybody or just for some? I, everybody. You don't believe that he only died for a few with limited atonement? He only died for those whom were predestined. No. He died for everybody. They, like, as long as you're living, there's still a chance that yeah, I don't believe in that part. I believe as long as you're living, Christ can get a hold of your heart and change you. Amen. I don't Amen. believe he just like, you're born and he's like, all right, done with this one. You're going to hell, never to speak to you again. And like, no. We will have all men to be saved. Amen. 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 It should be fun. I'm going to get some uh, clips and photos of the actual place too. You want to see my back room?